Looks like most of us are here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, once again, hello and welcome to all newly admitted Tridents for fall of 2025. We're so excited to have you here. And on behalf of the International Services and Engagement Office, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. Um, we know it's been a long journey here, so we're super excited um, to bring together all of these orientation events for you and to welcome you to UC San Diego. Um, I'm your host for the session. My name is Karina Ivanian. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an intake advisor here at ISEO. Um, I also have um, a great honor of being the program coordinator for our International Student Advisory Council, or otherwise known as ISAC. Um, when I'm not in the office um, and I'm not staying at home, <laughs> um, you can usually find me um, going to concerts or just exploring San Diego um, and yeah, if you see me at any of the events or just in the office, uh, feel free to ask for recommendations or um, best tips on how to navigate Ticketmaster and anything like that. Being things, um, if you've joined any of our sessions before, you may know that um, this webinar is set up in a way where it's in the listen only mode. It means you can hear us, uh, but we unfortunately cannot hear you. So we highly encourage you to utilize that Q&A feature on your screen to submit questions. Uh, we wanna make sure that we get um, to answer as many as we can, uh, but in a chance where you would like to connect with our office and we run out of time, please don't hesitate to go to icontact.ucsd.edu. This session will be recorded, so you'll be able to access the recording um, at inewstudentwebinars.ucsd.edu. Usually it takes us a few, um, a few days to upload, um, but um, it will also be available on our YouTube channel. And lastly, uh, we want to reward you for attending this session, but we also want to make sure that we continuously improving all of our programs. So we highly encourage you to stay until the end of the session um, to participate and fill out the survey um, to enter into a gift card, gift card giveaway. Um, and with that, um, today's session is focusing on undergraduate academic support. Uh, we're joined by colleagues all over campus who are here to support you um, as you navigate your academic journey here at UC San Diego. Um, so today you'll hear a little bit from our office, the International Services and Engagement Office. Um, we have colleagues from Academic Integrity Office, Teaching and Learning Commons, Writing Hub, um, and at the end, the true highlight of the session will be a student panel because we know you wanna hear from other students about their experience. Um, so with that, um, to give you an overview of US cl college classroom at UC San Diego, um, I'm gonna pass it over to Z.E. and Ishika. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, so we'll just start with some quick introductions from our office. So my name is Ishika. I'm one of the undergrads programs intern. Um, I go by she, her, they, them pronouns. Either is fine by me. I'm a junior this year at UC San Diego and I'm in sixth college. Z. Hello, everyone. My name is Z, and I'm the other undergrad programs intern here at ISEO. I go by she, her pronouns, and then I'm also a rising junior, and then I'm majoring in, I'm majoring in business economics with a minor in theater. Um, and with that, we'll start talking about the different aspects of a U.S. college classroom. Thank you, Ashika. So um, first of all, let's give um, let me give you a quick overview of what academic advising look like um, at UC San Diego. So the role of advisors is to provide information and then present options for you in regards to any academic questions or concerns that you might have. But then it's ultimately us, the students, students that make the decisions. So first of all, there are many types of advisors at UC San Diego. First of all, we have our college academic advisors. So they are the experts on your general general education, GE uh, courses requirements, um, and any other academic requirements that are specific to that respective college. And then they are often people that's of uh, that that are your first point of contact when you get into academic advising. And then the second one, we have major or department advisors. So they are specialists in your major or minor requirements, 
uh, or like the major minor that's in that specific department. Um, also, the career, uh, they also advise on career, graduate and professional school planning in that realm, and also uh, international education and then student research opportunities uh, specific to that realm. And also just to give you a heads up that both of these advisors, college or employment advisors, are both available um, for uh, available in person and also on our virtual advising center, short for BAC, which is at, which I believe is a platform that platform that you're gonna use uh, frequently um, in your uh, academic journey here. And then we have our ISU advisors. Um, so basically, they advise on uh, some academic problems or concerns that international students will run into. Uh, for example, um, the things that will impact on your visa. And then the ways to um, reach out to your ISO advisors are that you can first submit the contact form on our website or schedule an, an appointment on iPortal. And then we also have walking hours available at front desk located on the first floor of our office. And then you can check the um, timetable with a timetable for the um, walking hours on our website as well. Um, and we also want to give you a heads up that you do need to inform ISEO when you are changing your majors because it will impact some of the information on your um, legal documents. And then you also need to speak to your international student advisor if you're considering dropping below 12, uh, before considering dropping below 12 units, um, because it's also a tricky problem to handle. I personally been there, I've like ac accidentally dropped below 12 units before, and then it was like a pretty long process to handle it because it will it might impact your visa status as well. So be sure that you speak to your international student advisor instead of your college advisors if you're running into that kind of problem. And then lastly, we have our student organization advisors. They are the people that advise on business related to your to student org if you are involved. So just to sum up, each advisor's each advisor plays a slightly different role. And then there is a difference between your college advisor, major advisor, and international advisor. So be sure to check your plans with them, with all three of them, before making an academic change. At a glance, these are the main resources that you will utilize during your academic career here at UCSD. So we have the teaching and learning commons. We do have folks here from the teaching and learning commons who you'll hear, you'll hear them talk about more in detail about what services they offer. But in brief, teaching and learning commons is located on the first floor of Geisel West. Um, and Academic Achievement Hub, as you see on there, offers supplementary instructions, tutoring, among other services, while the Writing Hub are fo have folks who can look over your writing and give you critique, which is especially necessary when you're in college writing classes. OASIS, or the Office of Academic Support and Instructional Services, is located on the third floor of Center Hall by Library Walk, and it's another center that provides support for students throughout their time here. The language and writing program offers the LATS or language arts tutorial services where students can get support for their writing through tutoring services, specific workshops for their college writing program, such as the MC WP, which is for Muir, and the DOC program, which is for Third Grade Marshall. The math and science tutorial program offers academic support for lower division classes of chemistry, math, physics through workshops and drop-in tutoring. And you can read more about it in the link there. CAPS, um, short for Counseling and Psychological Services, their main office is located on the ground floor of Galbraith Hall in Revelle. They are a great resource for navigating through not just academic stresses, but through student life in general. At UCSD, they offer um, psychological support and mentoring and therapy sessions through your time here. The office number is back on, on the back of your student ID, so you can always call them to schedule an appointment. There are different options that are offered at CAPS. You can schedule a one-time appointment, a recurring appointment, work, or join workshops, community forums based around a certain theme, or even join a support group as well. And it's great for navigating cultural shock, feelings of isolation, even stressing out about American slang and such. Moving on, ISEO, which is our office, um, which is short for International Services and Engagements Office, as Z has mentioned, offers support for our international students through drop-in advising. We also have the iPortal for updating your information with regards to maintaining your I-20 device and hosting events and workshops such as these. Dropping, you can also get advice for, again, dropping down to less than 12 units and such. 
honestly, you can always come to us with a problem and we'll usually help you point you to the right direction, even if we cannot directly solve the problem. And finally, we have your professors and TAs. Always, always, always attend office hours. That's something your professor will also emphasize from day one at UCSD. It's just something that is really helpful. Um, even sometimes if you have to go sometimes out of your way to go meet them. Um, it's a great way to know more about the subject, get your questions answered without like a time limit being on there, and also build connections for later on. So some additional resources um, on top of what um, I should talk about. So we have first I, EIA, which stands for English in Action. So this is the program that uh, aims to Im uh, improve the conversational English language skills with international speakers on campus, uh, uh, with international visitors on campus, not just the student body. So the, and also the volunteers that works for EIA are the community members, faculty, staff, and students, et cetera. And then we have language conversation tables, short for LCT. So they sh they share, this is a place where you can share language and also the culture associated with it, and also serves a similar purpose uh, as EIA does. And then on the link of iresource.ucsc.edu, you can check out the other resources such as iFamilies, I financial and legal resources, living in San Diego, and language and culture, et cetera. Uh, these are, uh, I believe will be the resources that will help you get into uh um get uh get to know other cultures more and then also find the community that you feel like you belong to. So feel free to check out all those links if you feel that that's necessary for you. And moving on, textbooks are always going to be something that you'll require during your time here. These are some of the great places where you can buy textbooks. So UCSD Bookstore that's near Price Center, that's in Price Center, Amazon Rental, online versions of your books, UCSD Free or For Sale page on Facebook, and the UCSD Textbook Sharing Facebook group. Um, but I have so, a couple of general tips with regards to textbooks. One is make sure that text, the textbook that you're buying is absolutely needed for classes. Sometimes in some cases, not always, it is optional and it is something that um, works as a supplementary instruction instead of being directly involved in whatever you're learning. Two is don't immediately buy the textbook unless it is needed. I've had classes, um, say for example, my French language classes where they have required the textbook since it's more of a workbook from day one of instructions, but I've had other classes um, where I've ended up dropping the class and therefore buying the textbook for, it just creates an unnecessary cost to deal with. So don't immediately buy the book unless it's needed from the start because you may need to drop the class or change it later on. Try to buy used most of the time because they're definitely cheaper. Um, for example, like if you're taking literature classes and stuff, you often might need to buy novels um, that are often sold secondhand at UCSD bookstore and they're way cheaper. Um, unless again, if you need some, a brand new textbook, um, say for example, the workbooks that are used in French language classes, you need them to be brand new because you're gonna be filling in the exercises for yourself. And finally, sometimes, Buying is necessary for books and such because they are attached to homework codes and stuff that give you access to your homework. So in some cases, buying is pretty necessary. Um, so those are some general tips with regards to um, textbooks here. So we also want to highlight the importance of communication. So first of all, uh, the professors and faculty in general, they communicate on Canvas and also via email. So I believe as most, uh, as all of you have already like used it before, used it um, during the orientation, the Canvas is the platform where you can access all of your courses that you're enrolled in. And if you click in those courses, you will uh, having all of the information that you need for the course, like the assignments, the weekly progress, the materials, slides, et cetera. And then, um, and this is also the place where you'll see uh, the press, the announcement for the faculty, and then also like communicating with them on that. But just to give you a heads up that some professors don't actually use Canvas. And if that's the case, in the syllabus, they will be like, don't send me messages through Canvas. Uh, and then this kind of information usually will be highlighted or like marked in red at the top of the syllabus. But not often do that. So be sure to get this kind of information um, and read the syllabus very carefully for that. Um, and then also email as well. 
And also if it's for Q&A session only, there's another platform that's called Piazza. It's spelled with P-I-A-Z-Z-A. And it's for, um, as I said, Q&A session only. Um, and when it comes to um, sending, e when it comes to email, so first of all, be sure to always check your UCSD email because um, when you're deep into the quarter later, there will be emails flooding every single week, even every single day, um, no matter if it's about your academic courses or like the events on campus or the newsletters from student orgs and stuff. Um, and if you are waiting for important information to come in, be sure to check it frequently. And then also remember to mark the emails as important or like store them so that you can check back to them frequently if you want. And then when you're sending emails to the people, reaching out to people, people through emails, be sure to include proper context and see, stick to proper formality. These are pretty important. So first of all, we highly encourage you to include your identifying information. Actually, you probably need to do that whenever you're um, looking uh, for campus services and resources. Be sure to include your PID and also your names. These are crucial because um, we want you to know that faculty and staff, and staff on campus, they have plenty of emails coming in every single day on their inboxes. So if you don't include your identifying information, it's very hard for them to identify you and then provide the help that you need. And then when you're composing the email, you're also highly encouraged to use greetings and also full sentences. So some common greetings that we use are, um, for example, hello, X, Y, Z, the people, uh, the name of people that you're reaching out to. Um, I hope you're doing well, or I hope this email finds you well. And then after that, start uh, describing your problems, concerns, requests in full sentences, and then providing necessary details if needed. And last but not least, when responding to your emails, be sure to read the whole thing, not just the title or the first, uh, broad, first body paragraph, because you don't want to waste both of your time, both of your users' time, by uh, you know keeping circling back to the problem that's already been answered. And then on that note, I'll pass it on to Karina to talk more, more about our teaching and learning comments. So thank you, ZE. Um, so for the next part of the presentation, we want to discuss academic support resources um, at the Teaching and Learning Commons, and I'm actually going to pass it over to Marie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie Shear, pronoun she, hers, uh, and I'm going to be one of the speakers today talking about the Teaching and Learning Commons. Uh, specifically, the area that I will be talking about is going to be academic support, most typically as it relates to the sciences, mathematics, economics, physics, etc., um, so we are sort of our area within the teaching and learning commons is called academic achievement services, and we have two distinct areas within academic achievement services called supplemental instruction, also known as SI, as well as content tutoring. Um, before I sort of dive into both of those programs, um, I want to give you all sort of an overview when it comes to academic support, um, what our philosophy is. Uh, so we believe that learning is done best together with and from your peers. Um, so when you come to our center and when you come to our services, every tutor that you meet with, every SI leader that you meet with is going to be a current undergraduate UC San Diego student who has taken the class here, they've done well in it, and they want to help you do well also. Um, and so they go through a rigorous training process with us to be able to lead out on sessions and to lead those tutoring appointments to be able to have you learn and understand concepts. Um, but then at the same time, they're students just like you. Um, so they know tips and tricks. They know what it feels like to be a student in general chemistry at UC San Diego um, within recent years. Um, and so with that being said, our supplemental instruction program um, is going to be all about learning in groups. Um, so our SI leader, who is a student, again, like I said, an undergraduate student just like you, um, who has taken the class before, and they're actually retaking the class again with you, um, not for a grade. They're sitting in on lecture, and then they're creating study sessions outside of lecture, completely voluntary, completely anonymous to the professor, um, that are going to help support you in your learning in that class. Um, so if you are enrolled in any of the courses that are listed here, um, biology, chemistry, economics, math, management, psychology and physics, we are gonna be hosting sessions throughout the fall quarter, um, both virtually and um, in person. Our in-person sessions are located kind of all throughout campus, but most of our sessions are in Geisel Library. Um, on the bottom floor, if you go into Geisel Library, you take the stairs all the way down, 
that's where a lot of our sessions are going to be. But then we have an entire virtual space as well. So if you feel more comfortable learning in the virtual format or in the in-person format, um, we have session times available for you. Um, a quick student quote here that I think is important to highlight that students um, uh, self uh, state, I guess, that they feel more confident in their abilities when they come to our sessions and they feel included and respected. And so we want students when they come to our SI sessions and when they come to our services to feel like their knowledge, their skills, their voice is valued in the learning process, particularly in these courses that are historically very difficult. Uh, and so we'll move on to the next slide, which talks about content tutoring. So you may be saying to yourself, I don't know if I really enjoy learning in groups, or maybe I just need some extended time talking about one particular concept in a class that, that I'm enrolled in. And so content tutoring is going to be a great place for you. Um, you can meet individually or in a, um, you know, up to two or maybe even three students. So again, very, very small group, if not individualized, um, with a tutor who's going to be able to help walk you through some of the questions that you have. Um, something to sort of note on here that I think is important to say is that if you have homework for a class, our content tutors are not um, privileged to be able to do your homework with you, but what they can do is walk you through similar problems so then you can work independently to complete your homework and have the confidence to be able to do it because you've done similar coursework or similar problems with your tutor, either in person and virtual. Similar to our SI program um, or SI services content tutoring, we have in-person hours of operation and we also have vir uh, uh, virtual hours of operation as well over Zoom. Um, again, all of the courses that we are supporting for the fall quarter are going to be listed here. So if you are enrolled in those classes, then you're going to be able to be provided support through our content tutoring program. Um, and a last point on this, uh, if you um, are interested in learning more about our services, you can go to aah.ucsd.edu. You can see at the bottom of this PowerPoint slide, and you can learn um, a lot more information about our programs, but that was just a quick overview of what we do, and we hope to see you all there. We love learning, and we love learning in groups and together, and we want you to be successful in your classes, so we look forward to seeing you all at our services in the fall. And now I will pass it off to my colleague, Josh. Thank you so much, Marie. And good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Navarro. My pronouns are he, him, they, them. And I am the undergraduate writing tutor coordinator over at the Teaching and Learning Commons. So I'm very excited to talk more about the writing services that we offer for undergraduate students over at the Commons. So the one thing that I wanna focus on for this morning um, is our one-on-one -on -one writing support that we do offer at the Commons. So this is very similar to the content tutoring that Marie was talking about with the, uh, the, the, the specific content classes um, that we offer at the Commons. With our writing support, our trained writing consultants are able to help you and discuss any questions or things you wanna go over with your writing assignments across the entire genre or, or, or any sorts of content if it's related to writing. So whether it's something from your college writing program, whether it's from a lab report, or it's for a lab report for a, for a class that you're taking, if it's for an elective, even if it's something that isn't even on a class, maybe it's something that's more personal. Maybe you're writing a personal statement or you're working on a cover letter for a opportunity that you're applying for. If it involves writing in any sort of way, our writing consultants are gonna be trained and they're gonna be really excited to meet with you um, in Geisel or also online where we also offer online appointments. So some things that you can expect from a writing consultation. So very similar to the philosophies that Marie was explaining when it comes to tutoring or supplemental instruction, we really do believe that learning can really be very productive with a peer, someone who has taken the class before or maybe is familiar with the content that you're writing about. Our consultants are gonna be going into that conversation that you have with them in your appointments centering you in that conversation. So what do you want to write about? What are you trying to say in your writing? Our consultants are trained to engage with you in, in that sort of perspective of making sure that you feel comfortable about your own writing, you feel comfortable about, that, uh, about this conversation that you have with our consultants. They ask you a lot of questions 
about not only about the writing, but about you as an individual, your identity as a student and as a writer, and how that relates to what you're trying to say in whatever piece that you're coming in with in your session. So essentially, you'll be seeing how someone who's interested in the subjects or in the writing that you're bringing to their session is reacting to sort of your writings and seeing like what kind of questions that they'll be asking you throughout that session. Other things that you can expect is also delving, delving more deeper into writing as a process. So looking at yourself as a writer and the writing itself as sort of a journey in of itself. Um, what are the things that you wanna focus on uh, right now and sort of go from there. So we really do focus on making sure that you as the writer feel comfortable with whatever you're trying to say or whatever you're trying to bring into the conversation um, and less so about, you know, like what grade is this or um, what, how does this look like for like a professor or things like that. We try to make sure that we're thinking about and centering again, you as a student in that session. And overall, these writing strategies and ways of thinking about writing, they can be applied to future assignments and future projects. We always encourage repeat revisits. So whenever you have any questions about, you know, other things about the same writing assignment, we really do encourage our students to continue to visit the writing hub as this is ongoing learning. And it's what we really value at the Commons as a whole. So just a couple things as we close off and hand it over to <clears throat> academic integrity. This is a QR code that has that leads straight to our overall website. Um, you can go ahead and scan it. And in the next slide, it'll just show a little bit more about what it'll you, you can see to navigate. Once you navigate our website, you should see on the top bar um, all these different uh, different tasks you can check out. If you click on the four students, one of you hover over it. Um, in the next slide, we'll just sort of show the different sorts of academic services that Marie and I have been talking about, our content tutoring, uh, learning strategies, writing supports. So you can drop down and see all the different ways in which the Commons supports um, our undergraduate students. Um, last slide that we have, um, just a little bit more information about seeing our writing services specifically. And going on to our last slide, um, just final information is about how to reach us, contact us. Again, as Karina mentioned, we are located on Geisel Library in the first floor in the west wing of the library. We'll be open from Monday to Thursday on 9 to 8 p.m. And on Fridays, we'll be closing a little bit earlier at 5 o'clock. And these are, uh, just for clarification, our fall hours. Um, if you have any questions, you can call us at our number there or email us at commons.ucsd.edu, visit our website through the QR code, and you can also check us out on social media on our Instagram at UCSD underscore commons. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Academic Integrity, I believe, and yeah, thank you all so much. All right, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny. I'm an Education Coordinator in the Academic Integrity Office. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about academic integrity here at US, UCSD, um, why it, it's important, and um, some things that you can do to help ch you choose integrity um, throughout your time here. So I'm going to start off with our definition of academic integrity. What is it? How do we define it here at UCSD? We use this definition from the International Center for Academic Integrity, which is the courage to be honest, respectful, responsible, fair and trustworthy, even when it is difficult to do so. So you might notice this definition isn't school specific. It doesn't use language like cheating or plagiarism. Um, I will go over some concrete examples of what an academic integrity violation could be here at UCSD. Um, but the main thing to remember about this definition is that it's applicable beyond your academic life, um, right? These are really foundational values that are going to be important in your personal lives, that are going to be important in your professional lives. Um, so we believe that academic integrity is not separate from our personal or professional integrity. Um, we should be cultivating these values because they're going to serve us um, throughout our lives. Um, so whenever you're in a situation where you're unsure if something would be an academic integrity violation, um, you can think back to these values. Um, is what you're about to do or doing upholding these six values? If so, you are probably acting with integrity. So that's one kind of quick 
easy test you can use if you're ever in a confusing situation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about why academic academic integrity is important. Why do we care? Um, so the first is that academic integrity helps protect the value of the degrees here at UCSD. Um, when you apply to internships, when you apply to jobs, if you go to grad school after this, doors may open based off of the strength of UCSD's academic reputation. Um, so basically, do other people look at our degrees and trust that they're an accurate reflection of the knowledge and skills that are gained here. Um, we wanna keep the value of that degree for you, for anyone else who's graduated or will graduate from UCSD. So we need academic integrity to protect that. Um, also, we see academic integrity as an equity issue. What's most fair for all students here at UCSD? Everyone deserves an equal opportunity to succeed and learn. Um, but if some people are cheating, that's unfair to the rest of their peers. And then finally, I'd like to highlight that cheating can really hurt your sense of self. Um, it's like telling yourself that you can't do it on your own, that you can't learn, um, but that's not true. Um, so even in those moments where you're feeling doubt, you're struggling with something, um, it is actually really important to choose integrity in those moments because it's a way of investing in yourself and trusting in your abilities and your ability to learn. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some examples of what an AI violation could be, give you some concrete examples. Um, so the first, uh, unauthorized collaboration. So that would be completing an assignment with other people without permission, talking about an assignment when you're not supposed to, uh, going doing an exam together when you're not supposed to. Basically, anytime you're working with someone and your instructor hasn't told you that you can. Um, this can be tricky because um, your instructor might have different rules or expectations for collaboration than a different instructor. They might even have different rules for each type of assignment. So just because something is allowed in one class, um, do not assume that it will be allowed in all of your classes. Um, you need to kind of make sure that you're following the rules for that class, for that assignment. And it's your responsibility to be aware of those rules. Um, using sources without citations, um, plagiarism, uh, that can be popping something off the internet, off of Chegg, popping something off of your friend or someone else who's taken the class. Um, that can be an academic integrity violation. We do not recommend sharing work um, when you're not authorized to do so. Um, even if you have a friend who you're taking the class together, you wanna get inspiration, um, really please do not share work because it's really easy to accidentally fall into copying um, and accidentally plagiarize something. Um, and then you have an academic integrity violation. Um, Paying or asking anyone to create any part or completely an assignment for you is an academic integrity violation. And also using any kind of tool that you are not told that you can use. Um, like unauthorized collaboration, this one is tricky because some instructors might allow you to use certain outside resources, some might not. So it's your responsibility to be aware of what is and isn't allowed. So if you've not been told explicitly that you can use something like ChatGPT, um, or a translation tool or Grammarly, even, even things like that, you should assume that you can't use it or ask for clarification for the instructor um, so that they might give you some guidelines for how you can use it. So when I was reading these examples of violations, you might've thought like, oh, I don't think I would do that or this doesn't really apply to me. Um, but I, I just wanna reiterate that anyone can be tempted to cheat. Anyone can find themselves in a position um, where they feel pressure to cheat. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're a bad student or a bad person, but anyone can find themselves in this situation. It's kind of part of, part of being a human. Um, and recognizing that we might find ourselves in this situation can help us prepare for those situations. Um, so we have a list here of some challenges that we frequently see come up. Um, challenges to choosing integrity, they include things like stress, um, stress from your coursework, but also you know, you're not just a student, you're a person, you might have some stuff going on with your, your family, your friends, political things going on. There are a lot of things that can cause stress. Um, we see a lot of pressure to succeed, putting high expectations on yourself, either internally, or you're feeling a lot of pressure to succeed from um, external sources. Seeing that there are opportunities, um, things like ChatGPT, other generative AI is more available. Um, so that can be very tempting. Um, focusing on the grades instead of what you're learning, 
uh, feeling like you can't do it on your own, having that imposter syndrome, um, feeling like you're behind, um, feeling like everyone else is doing it. Uh, time management is a big one, either um, because you didn't plan your time well or you took on more responsibilities than you could reasonably handle. Um, time management can create um, challenges to choosing integrity, feeling like the instructor doesn't care or the class doesn't matter, um, not fully understanding the rules, um, and really just maybe not thinking through. When we're feeling stressed, sometimes it's really easy to make an ethical mistake um, to, to accidentally or intentionally cheat, but do something that you wouldn't have done um, if you had been thinking through it more. So I listed all of those. I'm sure there are more. Um, I think that you should think about challenges that you've faced in the past, challenges that resonate with you, that you know sometimes come up for you and have a plan. So what can you do in those challenging moments to encourage yourself to choose integrity, even when it's difficult to do so? So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the consequences. We do take academic integrity violations very seriously here at UCSD. Um, you may fail the assignment, your instructor, you could even fail the entire class. Um, that can impact your GPA. If it's a prerequisite, that can throw off your um, academic plan because you now have to retake a class. Um, it can result in probation, even suspension or dismissal, which I know can have some ramifications for visa and housing and things like that. Um, and then also it's it's cheating yourself out of learning. So you might uh, then not really have that foundational knowledge you need for the next class. And it can impact other people, especially if you're um, you know, collaborating with a friend and you're not supposed to, then suddenly both of you are, are dealing with this. So if you ever have an academic integrity violation um, or even an allegation, definitely reach out to ISEO because um, they can give you some um, specific advice about what that will mean for you as an international student in particular. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can do to prepare um, and set yourself up for success. Um, you can have a plan to choose integrity, and here are some tips. Um, so the big one, know the rules. Um, I've been reiterating this. Instructors might have different rules. Um, so make sure that you're aware of what's on the syllabus, what's on the assignment instructions. And if you ever need clarification, ask. Um, definitely ask. It's a better to ask for permission than forgiveness in this situation. Um, here at UCSD, we have a ton of resources to help you. Um, we actually just heard about some really great ones. Um, so thinking about supplemental instruction, content tutoring, writing support, if you're ever struggling in a class, um, and feeling that pressure, feeling that temptation to cut a corner to cheat, um, please look at the our on-campus reliable resources first. They're there to help you um, and they're there to support you in your success. Um, and then, oh yes, our on-campus reliable resources. Um, I listed a few. Um, I wanna highlight that we will continue to be a resource to you, our Academic Integrity Office. Um, we're here if you have any questions. We have student staff and career staff, so you can meet and have an advising session um, with a student um, who can talk to you about if you're facing a situation where you're not sure if it's academic integrity or you have an allegation you wanna know what happens next, um, we are here for you. So that is my last plug. Um, this is all of our contact information. We have a virtual front desk that you can pop into during our normal office hours, which are eight, a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and you can also come in person um, or email us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we recognize that, you know, we've shared quite a lot of information and it can be a little bit overwhelming, but I highly encourage you to connect with our colleagues in your time here at UCSD. Um, explore all of the other resources that are also available to you um, and don't ever hesitate, you know, to ask for help. Um, UCSD may feel very big and very overwhelming, um, but there's usually a lot of different offices um, that focus on, on specific areas that can assist you um, with your success here um, at UCSD. Um, as promised, uh, we do have a student panel for today's presentation. Um, I know we heard a little bit from Ishika and ZE, um, but we actually also joined by two more students. Um, so Emily, I'm gonna pass it over to you to do quick introductions.
Um, hello, uh, so I'm Emily. Um, not to confuse you all, but I'm, I've lived in both USA and Russia, uh, but I went to school in Russia, so essentially let's say I'm from Russia. Uh, I'm a rising junior and I'm currently studying international business and mechanical engineering. And Jamie, I'll pass it over to you next. Yeah, hello, uh, good morning. My name is Jamie Vegabar. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a rising sophomore and I'm majoring in political science with a specialization in international relations. For our first question, thank you both so much for the introductions. We have, um, what were some of the biggest challenges for you in adjusting to academics at UC San Diego? I can start us off. Um, so I guess for me, the one of the biggest challenges is the quarter system. Um, I came from a high school that did the semester system, so I'm very used to more long, drawn out sort of classes. Um, but the quarter system is fast, and folks don't realize it how fast it is until they do like their first quarter, like the entire first academic year. It's just ten weeks. And you have to like learn everything about at least three or four classes that you're taking and then give the finals on the 11th week. So that I would say is like the base of it and learning the base of it is has been one of my challenges here. Um, you go, you go. Oh, okay. Um, not to repeat what Ishika just said, but I also just want to add that despite that we have 10 weeks, we learn the material of a normal semester class. So if you're taking introduction to economics that you would take in 16 weeks usually, uh, in UCSD, you'll have to deal with it in 10 weeks. And as Ishika said, week three, four, you will have midterms, five, six, second round starts. And it's really hard. So time management is key. Yeah, I also want to add that um, what was pretty challenging for me personally was also, you know, the pace of the class. Um, some professors, I, I think it happens in probably most universities that professors sometimes they tend to go really fast. They like jump between chapters in the textbook and contents as well, or like back and forth. They might not go in the sequence that's like that that you should it should be. And also what and also like um, there is also a very high involvement of students like you need to really bring yourself into the conversation uh, with professors or with other students to like actually learn because it's such a you know student center uh, like learning system so you really want to like just um, try to like, participate as much as possible during the class to um, engage in this learning process. Jamie, anything you would like to add or should we jump in to our next question? No, the three others, I was just saying verbatim of what they were saying, but yeah, quarter system is a killer, but you learn how to get through it. With that potentially, you know, maybe it's um some of the resources that helped you overcome the fast speed of the quarter system or just in general, what would you say were the resources that helped you overcome um the challenges um in the academic realm here at UCSD? Um, I can start. So um, I personally, like other than, you know, the office hours that probably like, like most people will go to and utilize, I personally found the writing hub over at uh, Teaching Learning Commons very useful because, you know, um, I personally, because um, I'm from URC, so we do have this pretty um challenging writing series that's called MW, the Making of the Modern World. And me and my friends, like most of the time, we when we're like not sure about where we where we're at when we're writing our our essays, our papers, um, we will um I personally have like schedule a couple of appointments at uh with the writing assistant, student assistant over at the teaching and learning community at the writing hub, and they've been like providing really helpful, you know, suggestions also as somebody who's done the course before. So that's, um, that was a really helpful process for me when I was doing the course. And also I think it works similar to other um, like college writing classes uh, for like rebels or any other like also challenging courses. Um, the writing hub is a pretty useful resource and also uh, the student assistant that like student um, 
uh, volunteers I've met there, they're like really friendly and really encouraging me to like, um, like keep talking and keep like in touch so that like, you know, the process will be like more consistent. And also similarly, I've used Oasis before when I'm like writing papers and stuff for other, you know, business classes and stuff. Um, similarly, they, um, like the entire talking process, like, um, was usually really smooth. And then the suggestions are really um useful because you know they are students as well. And then if you're talk and usually it will be like sometimes um feels more natural and probably comfortable talking to your your peers, you know, um at a similar age and also somebody that's like been there before. So yeah, I would uh really recommend the resources that involves also like the, uh, involves the student body. So uh, that's like easier to access and also like easier to like use and talk to. I can, um, so these are just general resources that came to my mind. Um, and most of the folks will get to know them in a couple of days, but for just managing anything, I think TAPS is a great resource. Um, they not just and it's not just that you have to go into like a one on one session with the counselor. Sometimes it's just like you can go in as a group. So it's like less intimidating. Or sometimes I know they do host events in collaboration with other departments on campus. So all of those are like less intimidating ways if you ever get like stressed. And it is understandable. UCSD is a very fast paced university. So at any moment, if you ever need to like reach out for help, like they are there for you that's the entire point of them being there um and another resource it sounds very silly calling it a resource but i don't think enough people go there is the guys a library or avery wong's um bio med library both of them are really good spaces to study because after a couple of weeks when you come in you're just gonna start to find look for places to go study because you see it's just so crowded with people and guys, it gets really crowded during peak hours, but it's like, for me, the best way to sit down and focus on what I'm studying and not get distracted with stuff. So do visit the libraries. Yeah, so to go off of like Ishika and Z, um, guys will for sure. And I I also have to deal with the MMW course sequence. So when I was dealing or tackling with like essay writing and research writing, um, there was also the writing hub and the one that I frequently visit is the research hub in Geisel. So utilizing the research hub really like, I guess opened my mind to the possibilities of like using keywords and like, like smart tactics to like find the research that you need. And I know this isn't UCSD based, but later down the line or in a few days, like, like as cliche as it sounds, I have my friends as a resource as well. And like the reason why I say that is because um but like they're like your little angel on your uh, on your shoulder making sure that you're pushing through and that you got it and it's like just giving you all these affirmations you need to go on through the loops absolutely thank you all so much mm -hmm. for sharing um some of the ways that students can um utilize and kind of help themselves um to overcome some of the challenges that can come with the rigorous academic program um, at school. Um, something that a lot of our students are always curious about, and it's definitely a very challenging thing to do at times, but how do you maintain work-life balance and do you have any tips to share with others? Um, I can start. So it might sound weird, but I feel like the best way is to not procrastinate and to either enjoy your time or actually do work because, uh, at least I get into this cycle of feeling constantly guilty for not doing my work, but still not doing it and losing time. Some ways it can be even you're trying to study, like we go as a group to guys of library and we end up on the second floor and people are just, they're just talking. They're talking, talking. And while it's really nice, I am not done with my work. I need to go to eight floor and sit there till 12 and study after. Uh, so I suggest, highly recommend to kind of separate your work and life. Um, so you study 
your own time. And then you can, if you're not feeling like studying, go enjoy San Diego, go surfing, go with your friends to La Jolla to grab a coffee, join a student organization. That's also a good way to feel productive, but still like kind of get rest. So yeah, that would be my advice. To follow up on Emily, um, me and Z were talking about this question the other day, and I remember laughing and telling her, oh, I don't have a work-life balance, that's how I work. But in more, like, serious tone, it's like, I think a learning that I've had while being here at UCSD is just to, like, constantly push at having one. And it's like, sometimes it's in the form of scheduling your time in blocks on your, like, Notion, using something like Notion, Google Cal or whatever works for you is so good because for me, I know specifically not trying to remember every single event that I'm supposed to be at or classes that I'm supposed to be at is so helpful. And it also helps me manage my time between like, this is the amount of work that I have to do today. This is the time that I'm going to finish it. The rest of the time, I'm going to go do something else. Um, Again, to also echo off of, of what Jamie said, Having your friends by you is very important because they're the ones who like push with the life balance um, and also sometimes with the work because it's like having them near is like when you realize like, okay, I can go take a break. I can go have a have dinner with my friend or I can go to a cafe with my friend and you need no matter like there's a lot of work that you will be doing at UCSD and it's just constant workload because deadlines will always be in ever increasing your work will always be ever increasing but just like keeping in mind that like having your friends and taking a break sometimes is okay um since we are running um short of time i am going to jump into our next question um before we get to the answers um if you have any questions you would like to ask our presenters or panelists I encourage you to use the Q&A feature on this screen to submit your question. Um, but before we transition into that open Q&A section um, and final reminders, any advice you would give to incoming undergraduate international students navigating academics at UCSD? Obviously there's so much you know, wealth of knowledge that you have shared with us today, but if we were to boil down to one advice, what would it be? Um, I'd say, um, one thing is that don't don't stress yourself out too much, especially if you're first year. If you're first year, um, in college, because uh, we, when I was managing you know discussion uh, discussion board over at the over on Canvas, I see like so many um incoming students. They were like, uh, freshmen. They were like putting you know, uh, getting an A, getting like the best scores in my math class as their the goal of the first year, which is very good. I love that ambition and energy, but it's just that it's just really normal that there are gonna be ups and downs throughout the entire, you know, academic journal, academic journey. No, not just the first year, but like entire um college life. And and it's and it's just like uh, just to remember that like don't push yourself too hard and don't blame yourself when you're already trying your best for a class and especially also when you're not getting the ideal results or uh, scores that you want for a class that you thought is easy to navigate or like you thought that you already like it or like um that you really like because you know it's just like unexpected things happen even if like in, even if like, you're studying so yeah just um trying to like f focus more on your life probably uh more uh when especially when you're first year here because you know San Diego is such a big county and then when you're already like you know transitioning from environment to a new one you've already like done so much effort and it's time to give yourself some you know breaks and you know some things to relax by you know making friends like go, like going find to find communities that you feel comfortable in and like exploring the entire entire city entire place and just to give yourself, you know, enough like credit, um, like probably um when you're also navigating through academics. So that's one thing that I'd say. Yeah, you go can go ahead. ahead. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, well, mine is a quick one. Uh, read your syllabuses. Uh, people might find it obvious, but a lot of my friends barely read their syllabus. Kind of check the grading and leave but sometimes syllabus has so much information about all the policies like if you can't make it to a required discussion or extra credit or sometimes optionally they offer 
um, doing um, different way of grading. That's also very important. So read your syllabus in full. Yeah, I was going to quickly say, um, just to follow up of what Z said, it, back during my sixth orientation, my even my provost used to say, it, they used to say something called C's get degrees, which is like, sometimes if you get one C, it's fine. You can move on. Maybe not all of them being C's, one or two um, are enough to get, to get you through your degree. So that's something to keep in mind. Go ahead, yeah. yeah, thank you. But yeah, just keep, keep it brief to so, like verbatim what everyone said. It's okay. Like I was second year. I just finished my freshman year. But like, it's okay to not know what you want to do, especially with me, because it took time to like really get used to the environment and like actually like picking up habits that will help me. So it's okay to not know what you want to do. And also like read your syllabi. It is very important. You may never know that you might like get a bonus points. Um, speaking from experience <laughs> and then also um, attending lectures because once you start skipping then it's going to become a habit and then like you're going to be falling behind and it's, just, it's not going to help you at all well thank you all so so much uh, for sharing your advice and your experience with all of the students on the call today um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A feature so if something does come up don't hesitate to put it in um, or again, um, don't hesitate to reach out to ISEO or other offices that we heard from today. Um, if you have any follow-up questions um, or need clarification on any of the resources that are available. Um, the one parting thing, one point that I'll add uh, to um, what we've already discussed is please get involved. Um, you know, it can really help you academically as well. Um, getting involved and participating in different clubs and events um, can help you build communication skills. Um, it can increase your ability to work uh, with others and in a team setting. It's a great way to develop leadership skills as well as network. Um, and just know that, you know, there's so many different things, fun things happening on campus as well. So don't hesitate, you know, to step outside of your comfort zone, take a break um, and explore ways, you know, in which you can get involved. Um, a few that you may already know, or if not, I uh, highly encourage you to check out our International Student Advisory Council, the Globally Engaged Trident CCR opportunity. Um, even though, you know, um, orientation may be ending soon, um, there's still ways to get involved and participate and attend events. We have meetups, which are interest groups hosted by students for students, um, bus tour, international fan fest, international mixer, socials, more mixers, you know, everything, um, you know, that uh, is going on, especially um, something with a global focus will always be available on iEvents calendar. Things change there, like, almost every minute. So please feel, you know, visit it pretty frequently to see um, all of the events that are going on. Um, this is the time to enter into the giveaway. Um, so as I go over final reminders, I highly encourage you to scan the QR code to provide your feedback for this session. Um, if you haven't done so already and you're already physically in the United States, please make sure to submit the check-in form uh, via iPortal. To learn more, you can go to icheckin.ucsd.edu. Um, other sessions um, for orientation and again, events, the registrations is available on iEvents.ucsd.edu. And a great way to get in touch with our office is icontact.ucsd.edu. Um, with that, I know we went a little bit over, but I'm very grateful for everybody who stayed on the call until the end. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you were able to learn a little bit more about um, undergraduate academic support, um, and we hope to see you at other sessions. Thank you so much for joining us today.